Welcome to Cascade Community Foundation's Q&A live stream series and the premiere of our third season, a deep dive into one of America's most taboo subject matters, money. It's a bold topic being tackled over the next few weeks based on requests submitted by you, desirous to better understand the hidden reasons why we, as Americans, so often avoid sharing our financial circumstances with others, or perhaps seeking motivation to finally contact an accountant or tax professional who can help. Whether it's friends, relatives, or even our spouses and children, the verboten nature of money comes with many stigmas, and with that, stress and fears, riddled with anxiety-inducing consequences, the juxtaposition of money in our daily lives is almost comical given its role in almost everything that we do versus our painstaking efforts to shut down any attempt to converse about it. So throughout this season, we will bring you inside the topic, offering personal testimonies from residents and business owners willing to bravely share their own financial struggles and successes. Throughout the series, you're going to hear phrases like keeping up with the Joneses, compounding interest, and 401k, but I can assure you there's comfort in learning you are not alone if these terms conjure confusion or trigger that fight or flight instinct. That's why we've also invited local financial experts able to guide us through these testimonies and serve as a resource for those of you watching, searching for something to help free the logjam or jumpstart a change in your behavior. And I'm joined now by Tessa Kina, certified public accountant for Hungerford Nichols CPA and advisors and the moderator of our first segment. Uh, Tessa, you sat down with two business owners and two financial experts each of them have a very close relationship with the topic of finance. We've asked them to lift the veil uh, and get under the hood of both why money is a topic that we as Americans generally avoid, mm -hmm. uh, but also we want to get access to what they're exposed to as professionals with other members in our community uh, to help just kind of help us to face finances outright. Mm -hmm. What was it like to sit down with them? You know, it was really rewarding. You know, this is something that I do every day. It's a passion of mine, but to be able to sit with other professionals, both in the investment world as well as business owners, and really talk about some topics that are really hard to do. Um, you know, what one of the things I took from this is that, you know, planning is very important, but it doesn't take a lot to get started. And so just being open to the concept of listening and learning, the viewers are really gonna enjoy the topics we discussed, really help reduce some of the fears that come along with this topic and, and help them get started. Let's take a look at Tessa Kina's time with a few financial experts and business owners that we think will help you. Welcome to Cascade Community Foundation's Q&A live stream series. My name is Tessa Kina, and I'm excited to be part of season three because we're going to explore the topic of money. We have Jordan Bush, who is a partner at Alice Law in Cascade, Michigan, who helps families navigate estate planning in a tailored way intended to remove the worry and confusing parts of the legal process. Next, we have Elizabeth Eardley, owner of Crossroads Elder Care Options, who provides personalized care recommendations for families seeking care services for elderly people. Justin Knapp is a financial advisor with Edward Jones in Ada, Michigan, where he also lives and serves on the board of directors for the Cascade Community Foundation. Ron Cook, a former family business owner who was raising a family with his wife in the suburbs and came across a unique family budget curriculum, which he's going to share with us. Thank you all for joining us today for this topic on money and, and financial circumstances. So uh, a recent pre-pandemic study revealed that one in five households with affluent, wealthy suburban communities are living paycheck to paycheck. Now, personally, I came into the Cascade community when I was 22 years old. I was a single mom and I was able to purchase a condo. But at the time, I did not have any financial advisory services available to me and I really didn't know what I was doing. So I definitely knew I was getting myself into some debt options and, and didn't know what the future held for me. Um, so what do you, some of you see in this you know, environment, in the communities that we live in, that might um, lead to this concept of keeping up with the Joneses? So mm -hmm. I'll start with you, Jordan. Yeah, so often when we get to meet with clients for the first time, we want to identify uh, who, who our client's team is. And, and we want to sit in one chair of, of that team. We want to be their legal representation. But we're not their financial advisor. We're not their CPA. We're not going to be able to do tax returns for them. We're not going to be able, be able to manage, uh, you know, their finances or sell them insurance mm -hmm. products. So if, if if we meet with somebody for the first time and they don't have that good team in place, 
that's one of the que first questions that we want to want answered is who are the other people that are going to be sitting in those various chairs? Mm -hmm. The reason being, we want to make sure that they've got the professional expertise in all of those different aspects, really to keep them from getting overextended or being unprepared as, as life kind of rolls out. Mm -hmm. We're going to be able to provide the best in legal advice, but I'm not going to be able to provide Welcome financial to services like Justin is. I'm not going to be able to do the live stream taxes. series. Like My Nichols name is Tessa is Kina, to and I'm so excited and to be part of the If you lack the, the expert speaking into your life, that's when you can get into a situation <clears throat> where you're either overextended or unprepared. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and Justin, you know, some of the things we think about from a financial advisory standpoint and investment planning, you know, what are some of those concepts that you um, like to talk to, you know, the, the family owners that you're working with? Yeah, absolutely. I think where it starts is figuring out what's most important to your client. What's most important to them has to become most important to me for the relationship to work. Second, uh, we really focus on leveraging an established process to help them build a personalized strategy to achieve their goals. And then third, uh, partnering with them throughout life to keep them on track. Um, so. so Ron, um, American debt recently hit an all-time high of 14.9 trillion as of 2020, including a 31% increase since 2010. Again, going to, to this concept of keeping up with the Joneses, you know, what do you think contributes to that? I think our expectations, especially as younger people coming up, uh, is you live in the house that your parents uh, have provided, you see how they um, live and do their life, and you, as you graduate from college or graduate from school and start your financial life, as a fa maybe as a family or just as an individual, you kind of have that expectation set that that's what you're used to and don't really maybe take in, into consideration the 30 years or so difference in age that it took to get there and what it took to get there. So I think maybe one of the things that helps people overcome that is the family story. Uh, sharing those things that parents went through uh, to get there and establishing that you need to have your own story of getting there. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Elizabeth, uh, one of the things I always see is, you know, the different generations that, you know, we might be helping with, whether we're taking care of our children, uh, taking care of older parents. So that sometimes will contribute to our financial um, you know, disparities sure. possibly. So what do you see? Well, I think in, in our age bracket uh, or in the average adult that also has children and parents, things have definitely changed. Kids mm -hmm. are much more expensive than they used to be because school's so expensive and their needs are different. Um, and some of that is definitely keeping up with their peers. And um, the older people are now living much longer than they used to with much more significant care needs. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of people from age 40 to 70 or so find themselves both supporting their children and supporting their parents. And that's not just financial support, it's also emotional support, which is costly as well mm -hmm. because it, it's uh, stressful for people and they have different ways of, of dealing with that. Um, so <clears throat> what we think, you know, our expertise is elder care. So in terms of um, families that know that they have parents or loved ones that are going to be needing care in the future, um, to us it's all about education and making sure people understand truly what those costs may be. Mm -hmm. um, the good news is a lot of it is a little inflated in terms of how it's presented to families and they think it's going to cost, you know, $10,000 a month or $20,000 a month. And there are affordable ways to care for your parent um, and, you know, in a comfortable and dignified way. But it does take some pre-planning and some education to, mm -hmm. to figure that out. But there's a huge, huge burden these days mm -hmm. on, like, the working age folks with, mm -hmm. you know, in between the kids and, and their parents. Absolutely. Yeah, Liz Absolutely. mentioned college education and saving for college education, which is a, a fantastic goal. You know, we've got 1.7 trillion of college debt out there. Inflation is uh, among among college uh, pricing and schooling is increasing at a roughly six percent. I think for the last 40 years, inflation's been just about three percent. Um, so it, it's a struggle to pay for college education and savings. And we've got some phenomenal plans: uh, the MET, the MESP, the MI 529, as well mm -hmm. as. 529 plans that are held at uh, individual fund families, but with with some appropriate planning and, and working with a CPA like Hun Hungerford Nichols, 
Um, there are some great um, plans out there to take advantage of tax-free growth and if used for higher education uh, will help alleviate some of that burden that you were just talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's interesting, both Justin and Elizabeth both, both said the word planning. And so much of the fear that I think people uh, have when they're dealing with these issues is they have the fear of the unknown. And so much of the fear and anxiety as it relates to money issues or, or estate planning issues can really be relieved with, with information and education. When you know you have options in, in the elder care space, you're not terrified of the unknown. When you're planning ahead and using the power of compounding interest and you have a, you know, a, a long-term plan in place, it relieves those issues. When you're planning for, uh, you know, for funeral services and you know this is what it's gonna cost, this is what you know, mom and dad wanted, this is, how much it, you know, this, is what the, this is where they're gonna go, this is where they're gonna be buried. You remove the, the fear of the unknown from the estate planning side, we want to make sure that people have the education to know the, the issues that they need to deal with. And, and the education alone has a way of lowering the anxiety and lowering the fear of, of just what they don't know. Yeah, and I think that's what our goal here today too, is to educate, you know, planning is a huge component. I think throughout this, this topic today, we're gonna to hear a lot more about different ways to plan. You know, I think what I, I see as possibly some of the issues that might come is when you plan and then unforeseen circumstances happen. So over this last year, the pandemic has caused a lot of job loss or decisions that families have had to make, whether one stays in the, you know, the career field and one stays home, you know, different school decisions for their children. So from an invest investment standpoint and, you know, you had two incomes, now you're down to one and, and you're living in a community where it is more affluent, hmm. right? And um, your children don't necessarily understand the circumstances that you as the parents are in. So maybe, you know, could you speak to that a little bit about, you know, how, when those situations happen, you know, how to think through that and try and plan for the different change that just occurred? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at the end of the day, what I tell people I do, I help organize, grow, protect, and transfer wealth. And that's why you have such a beautiful team here. Um, that helps along that mm -hmm. that uh, that that entire lifespan. But um, you know, an emergency fund is absolutely essential. Uh, we help individuals, families, business owners build emergency funds. It's pretty basic, pretty simple. Mm -hmm. But you know, three to six months of non-discretionary um, expenses um, saved on the side in case the unexpected happens, because it's not. Uh, if it will happen, it's more of a, a win. And um, I, if I can just jump back to, to something that, that Jordan said about the, the established process, I think from a financial planning standpoint, um, stocks, bonds, and portfolio allocation are increasingly commoditized. But what's not is the planning. The planning and using an established process to help individuals, to help families, to help business owners achieve their goals. And um, when you sit down and whether, you know, depending on what the goal is, if it's planning and preparing for retirement, but when you sit down with that individual, with that family or a business owner, and you go through detailed information, like when do you want to retire? Uh, what do your liabilities look like? How much are you saving for retirement? What's your plan with social security? Will you inherit money? or do you plan on any other income in retirement with annuities and pensions? And then let's talk about some assumptions uh, with inflation or tax rates, and let's get a plan together. That coupled with um, talking about volatil volatility and risk tolerance helps alleviate the unknown. And once people know they have great confidence in the plan and you can execute according to plan and, and change as you go so that when you go through a life event like death, divorce, change of job, um, or the unexpected, um, you can keep them on track. So absolutely. Yep. Yeah. So Ron, I'm going to go to you in a second here. Only five states in the U.S. require standalone financial courses in high school, while just 15, which includes Michigan, mandate financial literacy be at least integrated in the course. <clears throat> so what are we doing to, you know, help the next generation understand what financial literacy is as parents, as business owners, as professionals? Uh, I guess in our, ho in our house, uh, my wife and I have four boys and varying ages, 12, eight, six, and two. So uh, with our 12 and eight year old, we're doing family meetings. Uh, we do 
I would love to say we did every week. Realistically, it's closer to once a month. And we sit down and we go over their budget. So we don't really discuss our, our household budget, but we talk with them about uh, you know, the money that they've either made through having chores and working or um, actual, we do an allowance just so that they get, it's not so much so that they have money, but so that they start learning how to deal with money. Mm. And it's really simple. Uh, the first thing you do when you get something is you give something. And the next thing you do is save something. And then after that, you spend it. <clears throat> and we're trying to work with them to figure out what's worth saving for, what's worth sa- uh, spending on, and, and what does it mean to be able to give first uh, every time. Mm-hmm. And so that comes a little bit out of our faith, you know, uh, that first fruits idea of giving. And it is, it's been really uh, unique to see it has kind of clicked for him at different points. All of a sudden, my 12-year-old is starting to learn about how cool cars are. Mm-hmm. and getting ready to look at that long-term goal where my eight-year-old is trying to save up to buy a bigger Nerf gun, you know? <laughs> uh, it's, so I think just, uh, Justin, you were talking about some of those big life events, death, divorce, um, loss of job, and that really stood out to me because so, so often people go to get help in an emergency uh, when if we did talk about a plan before that, then you're editing a plan. You're not having to come up with a plan when you're under that emergency. That Mm -hmm. relates a lot to what I do in pre-planning for funerals. Uh, It's a lot easier to discuss a a death when you're not in the moment of it. Mm -hmm. And I think we all feel when we encounter those really big life events, like you're crushed by the emotion, the stress and everything else, and you really probably don't make the best decisions in those times. So when you do it in advance, it alleviates all the pressure. Mm -hmm. You just get to go in and talk to somebody you already trust to help figure out how you're going to edit that plan you're already already working. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with that more. I mean, Jordan and I were just talking before this, and we've worked on a number of cases together in the estate planning process. And I'd argue, and I'm obviously biased here, but a a strong financial advisor would help quarter that quarterback that uh, between advisors, and and that's why we you know lean on companies like Alice Law so much to put those estate planning documents together before it's too Mm -hmm. late. You don't have to wait until Mm -hmm. mom, dad, grandma, grandpa are in a nursing home or um, going, you know making some end of life decisions to make sure your estate's buttoned up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's important too, too, um, for everyone, no matter what decision you're making around your finances or life planning or whatever, we find that a lot of families just rely on like what their neighbors are doing or Mm -hmm. what Mm -hmm. their friends are doing in terms of like the decisions that they make. And that's not the greatest source of information. I mean, it certainly can be a part of it. You know, you wanna respect your, your friends and loved ones' opinions. But there's a reason that there are experts that are in their particular niches. Mm-hmm. And there's, you know, I have an understanding of what Jordan does and what Justin does, um, but I am not an expert in that, and they're not an expert in what I do. Mm-hmm. And um, so just realizing as a, as a regular person going on with your life and having all these issues, there are experts out there for you to get help from, and it's often you know, at at no charge initially, the consultations to see if you're Mm -hmm. a good fit for their services. But I would would advise people to not bury their head in the sand and Mm -hmm. and get a hold of those experts and talk to them. What would you say would be, you know, for those that maybe don't have that generational wealth, right, to like Ron Ron talked about a little bit, you know, where you kind of have always been surrounded by something where your life has been okay, you Mm -hmm. haven't had to worry about it. You know, but there's a whole new generation of entrepreneurs and business owners, a diverse population throughout the community that, that might not have had the, um, the, the foresight from their you know, parents and grandparents to teach them that. I mean, we talked about the planning, the budget processing, but, you know, someone that might not have wealth, you know, from that understatement is, I don't think I can afford a financial advisor, right? <clears throat> so I don't know, maybe if you want to start with it and then yeah. Justin... Yeah, so you know, we we say the ostrich with its head in the sand gets eaten first. Mm. Um, it it doesn't save you from what's coming. You just don't know that it's coming. And mm-hmm. and often we have initial consults and people come in and they say, well, I don't feel like I have an estate 
and therefore I don't need an estate plan. I'm not a multimillionaire. I'm not, I don't have all of these things. And then we break down what are the actual issues that, that surround estate planning or financial planning or, or tax prep. Uh, we actually break down and, and show that it's applicable to everybody. And so the, the more that people are intentional about it, the more that they can recognize for my facts, for my scenario right now, this is the analysis and therefore these are the tools that I need to accomplish the goals. Long before we're ever in a crisis scenario, it makes it so much easier to adapt on the fly like we were talking about before. Now there's some people, like you said, they're, they're simply ignorant to it, meaning they've, they've not been exposed to it. It doesn't mean they're unintelligent, it just means it never has been on their radar. Mm -hmm. So it's our job really as professionals to get out there and educate people saying, look, these are some of the issues that you might not have ever thought of, but they're gonna be applicable to you. And it's not just, uh, you know, grandpa's going to die when he's 100 years old and how do we pass on wealth? It might be, you know, the 19-year-old who's at college for the first time and his parents might not realize if he's ever injured uh, and, and needs somebody to make medical decisions. They might not have access, legal access or legal authority over decision making. Mm. That's very applicable to not somebody with a massive estate, but that's applicable to anybody with teenage children who are over 18 who are going off to college or maybe their first, first careers. So it's bringing issues that are otherwise, you know, really big picture things and bringing them down to this is how it would affect your life. Mm -hmm. And then educating them on here's some of the things that you can do ahead of time to, to, prep or, to be prepared and be ready uh, for when those situations do happen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, all great points. Um, you know, we've all got to do our part. I, I think it's been said before, but you know, in, you graduate from high school and you know EM, E equals MC squared, but you don't know what a stock bond or how to create a budget. Um, as parents, Ron alluded to it, but we've got to we've we've got to increasingly have our kids have skin in the game. That's that's a mm -hmm. big deal around my house. Uh, you alluded to it. Uh, you want that toy? No problem. We'll buy it for you, but you're going to put in money for it as well. You've got a custodial account, a 529, an individual account. We work with a lot of individuals and, and families as well uh, in creating some incentive systems or mechanisms that if mom and dad put money for college education savings, um, uh, the, the, the child is too, or vice versa. If the child puts in, mom and dad will, will match it. So mm -hmm. um, definitely working at the high school level, um, you know, in, in education, that's pretty general, but um, as parents and then also as financial advisors. I think as financial advisors, we've got to continue to focus on complete human-centric wealth management, planning, mm -hmm. pulling advisors together, quarterbacking, I, I said that earlier, uh, the, in, the entire estate, um, and asking great questions. What does retirement look like? What are your dreams? Day one of retirement, what are you doing? Um, and, and really help connect the emotion of that and uh, with, with the individual investments that, that, that they're investing in to mm -hmm. help them achieve those goals. So, Yeah, going back to the topic of, of college and planning, you know, Ron, you mentioned your four children and one of them being, you know, closer than not to that age of, of college. Are those discussions you have about what that looks like for the future and, you know, how they might be part of their contribution to their own college career? Yeah, so one of the uh, discussions that he and I are having is, you know, he's still, he's 12, so he, there's a good chance in his mind that he may be, uh, you know, on a scholarship for sports, and, and that may be, we don't, we don't know, but we're not going to count on that. Um, and so, if not, now as you start to decide about what school to go to, what school not to go to, what are those repercussions in the short term and the long term, and we've shared pretty openly about the fact that we have saved in advance for their, their college, but there's a limit to how much we're going to be willing to contribute and mm -hmm. that there's going to be, you know, uh, accountability for his performance while he's there if we're going to continue to pay. And I think that's something that, um, frankly, with my oldest son, that's not something I'm not worried about. He's, he's very studious, but as we get, every kid's different. So mm -hmm. We're gonna. We're kind of setting the groundwork for. Mm -hmm. Who knows uh, if some of them may not want to go to college? What does that mean for the money we've saved and all those type of things? And <clears throat> that's way more up your alley than mine. <laughs> uh, and I'm, uh, but yeah, there's there's um, there's a lot that goes into those conversations. But I think just having it is really the key. Is that they know mm -hmm. that they can come talk to us about it, and that we're gonna be talking to them about it as we go along. 
I have two sons, one of which they're 21 and 22, and one chose to go to college and one chose not to. And because I did have their college saved savings at a 529, that helped a lot because mm -hmm. I was able to take the money from the one that didn't go and transfer it and it could be used, so that was great. And it's just interesting to see when you're talking about financial education, the one that didn't go to college is actually quite re responsible, but he's taking it upon himself as his education is what he calls like adulting. So mm -hmm. at the age of 19, he's paying his own health insurance and car insurance and all that. And the one that graduated from college doesn't even know what that is. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's pretty funny mm -hmm. how the one that's had the real life, grocery shops, he lives in Colorado, he does everything on his own and handles his own finances. And the one that went to college was busy being educated, which is great and he'll get there, but he is kind of like, now how much do I have to pay for health insurance <laughs> once you don't pay it anymore? And it's just an interesting how the different paths in life will change how mm -hmm. they look at their finances, yeah. Mm -hmm. And having these conversations, I think, uh, at, a, at an early age makes it, takes some of the taboo and takes some of the mystery away from it. Uh, it makes it very real, hopefully, hopefully for, for children as they're going through middle school and high school, anticipating, yeah, this is going to be, this might be a real decision that I have to make, or it might be a decision that I'm, I'm not going to get value from, you know, a, a $200,000 education in college, and mm -hmm. I'm great at doing this, whether it's, you know, whether it's the trades or whether it's something completely different, and making that just as okay as, 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 as a path that might be different for somebody else. Different facts, different analysis, you know, mm -hmm. each individual has their own path. And it's having that intentional mindset early on, planning, 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 and not doing crisis. Oh my goodness, I'm graduating from high school. Now what am I, now yeah. what am I gonna do? And the more normal you make it, the, 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 the fear is gone and the easier it is to make those good decisions um, than, than trying to scramble at the last minute. That yeah. is so true. And it, there is an enormous amount of value in communicating that to the child. Mm -hmm. I just think two generations back, my grandpa dropped out of high school, lied about his age and enlisted in the Navy to fight World War II. He never graduated from high school, certainly didn't go to college. And a couple generations later, the expectation was that we would go to college. So some of our, our best clients will actually, and we'll ask them to bring, bring in your kids. If they're 10, 11, mm -hmm. 12, 13, 14, 15, bring them in and let's go through this process together. And you can see the kids and the wheels start turning and just the value of, of communicating, hey, mom, dad, mom and dad have saved money for you to go to college and putting that plan together so that they know where m mom and dad will pay for 50%, 75%. Um, mm -hmm. and, and there's just, there's just an enormous amount of value in that. So kind of moving into that next generation, we, you know, we find where there's sometimes where families both are taking care of, pair of their older parents and then their children. So you probably see this a lot of times and that adds a whole nother level of financial stress, possibly burden to the family. You know, what do you see in these circumstances? A little well, bit? the first thing when you were speaking of, you know, trying to have that conversation with the older generation, they, they can be very, very private about their finances mm -hmm. and it's important to approach them with a lot of respect. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the fear is based on thinking that their money is going to be taken from them or that they're they're not gonna be able to make decisions. So we advise families to approach things really slowly and make sure that you, uh, your, your loved ones understand that these are their decisions and it's their money, but you really can't help them until mm -hmm. you have a better understanding. And just take it slow um, and, and keep reassuring them that you're, you're on their side. Um, you know, we find most of the families that call us that are looking for care for their parents, unfortunately, most of them aren't contributing to that. It's based on what the parents have to a large, large extent. So we're really looking at, you know, the elderly person, what's their um, investments, um, savings, social security, long-term care insurance, or their ability to qualify for programs like Medicaid um, or different, different social service type programs we have. Um, so we don't see that people really have the money, honestly, to help out their parents too much. And mm -hmm. the, you know, we work with a lot of people, but that's generally the case. So it's all the more important to really get a firm grasp of um, information on what they have so you mm -hmm. can make good decisions. 
what mm -hmm. options you know are out there for families that maybe their mm -hmm. their parents weren't able to plan for it. You know, yeah, and then sure. It falls on there the are a lot of options, and you know, it's I, I liked whoever made the ostrich comment <laughs> <laughs> because it is true. Like you cannot just bury your head in the sand. You know, mm -hmm. especially when you're talking about your ability to like take care of yourself throughout the day. I mean, if you're unable to walk or go to the grocery store or see or you have memory loss, you need help. And there's a lot of misinformation out there that you either pay, you know, $400,000 to buy into a continuum or you're in a nursing home that you might remember from like 1950. Mm -hmm. And there are so many other options, it's unbelievable. There's lots and lots of resources in Grand Rapids for people to be able to be at home with different ways to care for them, um, to be in like day type centers, like our PACE programs and our adult day centers to be in independent living communities that have home care agencies coming in. Mm -hmm. um, and again, some of the funding sources would be Medicaid, Medicaid waiver, long-term care insurance. Our senior millage provides a lot of services, our tax mm -hmm. based at our um, area agency at aging. There's a lot, there's a whole lot. It's hard to know what you qualify for and when based on your age, your income, your mm -hmm. diagnoses, your homebound status and everything else. And that's, that's where our expertise comes in frankly, is helping people understand which of those things they're going to qualify for so that they can afford to have care. Because what a lot of people don't know is there's a lot of elderly people shut in in their homes right now, right in Grand Rapids, right in your neighborhood, mm -hmm. that haven't eaten, that are in soiled clothes. In the winter, they're cold, they're frightened, they're preyed upon by people that are trying mm -hmm. to sell them things that they don't need or want. And they they need to know about these resources. They need to not think that if they ask for help, they're gonna be put in a nursing home. It's a myth. I mean, that's yeah. just not how it works. Yeah. yeah. What about you, Jordan? Our, our, our professional lives get to overlap a lot in this, mm -hmm. in this exact world, you know, as an estate planning uh, firm. These, these are the types of the issues that we, we're often planning for. And when we're talking about long-term care, there's cash and investments, there's long-term care insurance, there's programs, if, you know, if you're a veteran, aid and attendance, some other programs mm -hmm. through the, vet uh, the Veterans Affairs Department. And then, and then also Medicaid, Medicaid waiver. And us structuring the estate from a legal standpoint, often giving the children a, a, of somebody who's older legal access and legal authority to make mm -hmm. decisions if, if we need those, you know, if, if we've dealt with an incapacity issue, for example. But then getting the families tied in uh, with Crossroads, mm -hmm. and that way they can start looking at the different options. It's not just, you know, two sides of one coin. It's not no, pro you know, no help at all, or I'm in a full-blown nursing home mm -hmm. and it's costing me $15,000 a month. There are so many different levels along the continuum of assisted care and, and independent living that getting tied in with professionals who can actually make that connection between this is the actual need and this is the actual resource. Mm -hmm. And then also the plan that's flexible enough that when the need rises, we can then adapt to the, to the next stage and the next stage. So this is something that we get to deal with you know, every week at, at our firm. And we're so glad to have you know, experts who are, can help in the placement uh, process while we're structuring the, the, the legal documents to make sure that you've got the access and the legal authority to make sure that mom and dad or grandpa and grandma or whoever are actually taken care of. Yeah. Once you've saved enough for retirement, the biggest risk is that something changes in your health. Yeah. And that, that's exactly what Jordan just alluded to, but again, is why we lean mm -hmm. on Crossroads and mm -hmm. Alice Law uh, to make sure that those, those things are taken care of. Yeah. Ron, I think about kind of that next, you know, end of life stage uh, and that you have a lot of experience in. What are some, you know, pieces of advice you could offer to us as, you know, families in the community to, to think about planning? You know, what are some simple steps we can take to kind of plan for that phase of the future? I think every single person here has been talking about planning and, and all I can say is start. I guess that's the best mm -hmm. part about it is if you've got a plan with Crossroads ahead of time to figure out what our options are when we get there. It's not overwhelming amount of information to try to process when that time comes. The same comes in with funeral planning. Um, and sometimes funeral planning goes in with estate planning mm -hmm. and Crossroads and related in financial planning for uh, Medicaid spend down is something if you're, if you're getting to that age where that's a part of the conversation, you know what I mean already. Mm -hmm. If you don't, um, it is something that, you know, we help with as funeral pre-planners uh, protecting your funeral plan so that no matter what happens in the rest of your finances the funeral won't become a burden to the surviving family members and um, 
having that conversation when the people whose funeral it's going to be can actually have some input into sharing what they want the legacy of their life to be mm -hmm. communicated at that funeral is really important. But also incorporating the needs of the people who are surviving. That, mm -hmm. that, the funeral actually doesn't help the person who died at all. Um, it is those that are left behind that are actually gonna have those experiences and really meet those needs. So we wanna make sure we factor in all of that. You mentioned um, uh, children helping their parents, but I have seen an amazing number of grandchildren stepping in to help figure mm -hmm. out their grandparents' funeral plans, estate plans, mm -hmm. and acting as uh, legal guardians. And I just think that's, uh, that's telling us that there are a lot of people in that 40 to 70 range that are maxed out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the grandchild is stepping in. Mm -hmm. And so I think asking for help, being willing to step in and learn about the process is something that maybe younger people can start doing and it just gives you a good picture of what's ahead of you uh, mm -hmm. when you're doing it. One of the other things we haven't talked about is really on the as business owners and like what that looks like, you know, what's our responsibility to our teams and our people, you know, to help them understand that. Because maybe they don't have uh, someone in their family that can help them understand what, you know, financial things they should mm -hmm. be planning for. So is there any things that we could do as business owners to help, you know, give our you know, information to our team members to help them if they might have questions or are unsure, especially when it comes to any retirement planning? Absolutely. We have, I think, more family-owned businesses per capita in West Michigan than anywhere in the country. And those business owners, uh, especially as they age, one of their main goals is to pass the business on and how do I do that in a tax-efficient manner. Um, we work a, a lot with business owners on business retirement plans. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to be a big conglomerate to set up a 401k. And um, after cash flow, retaining and attracting employees is mm -hmm. probably number two mm -hmm. on the list for any business owners. Um, they're affordable, they're, they're easy to set up, and um, we've, we've got a lot of experience in, in this realm. But setting up a 401k, a simple IRA, a SEP, setting up some type of business retirement plan to attract and retain employees, uh, as well as transfer wealth in a tax efficient manner mm -hmm. is, is one of the biggest questions that we get. Um, I can speak to that a little bit. I, my company is small, Crossroads is uh, only, there's only five of us. And actually, um, Justin's company helped us to set up a 401k. And there's only five of us. And most people wouldn't think that that would make sense, but it absolutely makes great sense. And it's awesome for my employees. Mm -hmm. um, it definitely, you know, you talked about with kids having skin in the game, like they kind of do mm -hmm. as well um, yeah. with the 401k. And um, it, it, you know, I think the number, I, I think you can tell a company is successful based on how they treat their employees. Um, absolutely. More first before their customers, their employees. And I think uh, a big thing that people need, I've learned over the years, isn't necessarily more money. What they need is they need flexibility. Mm. And they need, I employ all women, just coincidentally, but they're all um, mothers and wives and they need to be able to, you know, have that flexibility to take care of a sick child or, or help a, a parent or whatever the case may be. And that's more important to them. I mean, they want to be paid well, and you know, we do everything we can to make that happen. But there's a financial that that works out well financially for them, mm -hmm. for that, mm -hmm. for you to be able to offer that. Um, so, I know that my first goal is always to make sure that my um, staff is is uh, treated really well, and then that makes my business more successful for sure. Absolutely. And I think recognizing that that the humanity of, of the team, you know, you'd mentioned a human centric uh, planning method, mm -hmm. just recognizing that, that each of your team members is going to have stuff happen, life continues to happen, and being able to be flexible with that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not just, you know, can you pay them another, you know, dollar an hour, that's, mm -hmm. I think that model is, is aged and gone. So being able to look at people holistically and say, what needs actually need to be met? Uh, you know, at our firm, we, we, all of our staff goes through our initial process and then sets up an estate plan. So not only is this something that we do for clients, this is something we do for our own team. And, and more often than not, our team, you know, having gone through the process, 
when they're the actual ones sitting in the chair having to make these decisions, it gives them an entirely different perspective on, on the estate planning, like the, the need and, and, and what can actually happen. Uh, same thing with financial services, same thing mm -hmm. with, you need to live it to actually have it you know, sink in. So being able to expose your team members to what you're doing, I think is critically important. You know, one of the things, Ron, you brought up was teaching your children at a young age uh, giving back. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that, you know, is also in financial planning, right? You know, we can look at what is our legacy going to be like and, you know, being able to be, you know, mindful of your finances so that you can also, you know, share with others. And I think in West Michigan, you know, we have a very, very generous, you know, community. And, um, you know, maybe speak to that on just, you know, teaching our children, but then, you know, teaching others what it means to give back, you know, with, with what you have, whether it be in your finances or your time. I think um, for us, like I said, it's been connected to our faith first and that direction, but uh, it has become one of the bar favorite parts of our marriage is when we get to do something, uh, we have our structured part of how we do it, and then we want to live a life of generosity. And so when we have opportunity or see an opportunity to be able to do that, it is so much more of a gift to us. And I think stepping out and doing it before you think you're ready for it is probably the recommendation I would give is like, oh, I don't have a lot of money. I can't do that. It doesn't have to be a lot of money necessarily. Like you said, it can be, it can be time, but we're all strap for time too. So mm -hmm. maybe money is the starting point and it might not be money you think you can afford to give, but doing it and stepping out in that way, I think um, it is something that really brings joy to the giver. And that is why I think our community is so generous because we many people have seen that. And, mm -hmm. um, it's, yeah, it's a gift. Nobody has ever come into my office and said, Justin, I got a bone to pick with you. We've saved way too much. <laughs> yeah. I've yet to hear that. Nobody's ever said that. They almost always say one of two things. I'm glad we started when we did because it's allowed us to do some of those legacy items or charitable giving um, that we want to do, or I wish I had started earlier. Mm -hmm. So teaching kids what Albert Einstein called the eighth wonder of the world, compound interest and time value of money, as well as employees, you have an opportunity to fundamentally change the course of somebody's life mm -hmm. um, and increase their quality of life, as well as maybe pass money down to the next generation or give it to a cause that they have a deep conviction for. Yeah, that's great. So any, you know, um, small tips for just starting out? Um, so whether it be in the family or the small business that you can offer to our community and those watching. I'll start with Jordan. I'd, I'd say if you've got that checklist that you're like, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get to, you know, buying that life insurance or I'm gonna get to getting my estate plan done or I'm eventually I'm gonna meet with that financial planner, do it. It's, mm -hmm. it's you know, I know all of us are, are available for, for consultation and, and love to meet. But just do it. It's as simple as it's as simple as doing that first step. Now that doesn't mean you're going to understand the entire process. You don't need to. You just have to have that first step. Make that call. Make that email. Mm -hmm. Check us out. You know, check us all out on, on our web pages. But just do that first thing. If it's been out there for you know gathering dust on the checklist, do the first step. Get in touch with the right professionals who will lead you through the rest of the process. But don't wait until it's too late to to actually begin the process. Um, just do it. Yeah. Elizabeth, how about you? Uh, well, along the same lines, um, I feel like a lot of the families that call us have, they usually go through a lot of pain first um, before they will give us a call and, and they have to be referred to us sometimes two or three times because they don't really understand how helpful we can be. So, you know, if anybody's watching this today or has worked with us in the past, they know that when folks call our office, we just say, you know, we're gonna help you understand all your options. Tell us what's going on. It's that easy. Mm -hmm. You don't even have to know what you wanna know or because the truth is you don't know what you need. You mm -hmm. just don't know it. It's not, it's not something that you've done before and uh, you just don't know it. And uh, so I would recommend just, our services by the way are totally free to families too. So anybody can call us anytime. Um, and then just real quickly in terms of being, um, a business owner as a woman this is my second business and I do have a lot of um, I sometimes mentor some younger women 
that want to start businesses and it seems like such, such a mystery to them and they want to prepare for years and years before they start and it's just like anything you know to go ahead and just take that first step um, and learn as you go you don't have to be a hundred percent know everything you want just like you can't plan out your whole life you know you have to just like I think you were saying there's like an unknown and you just you have to take that leap of faith and believe in yourself and give it a shot so yeah there's a Chinese proverb that says when's the time best time to plant a tree 20 years ago yeah. when's the next best time today and um, I can't help but quote Chinese proverbs. I lived in China for over a decade, but um, doing starting somewhere. As a financial advisor, I feel like on a daily basis, I'm trying to get individuals, families, business owners, just to make a 1% change. And the compound effect of making 1% changes over the course of your life can mean thousands, hundreds of thousands, or even millions of, of dollars mm -hmm. when you look at compound interest and time value of money. So start small, start somewhere. On average, we've got to save between 10 and 15% of our income, 10 to 15% of our income for 25 years during the accumulation phase to be able to distribute that out in retirement. Wow. Ron, how about you? I think uh, avail yourself to your resources. There are so many things, whether it's radio programs, uh, professionals that are there, just listen and learn and gather as much as you can uh, to, to get started and then find somebody that you can trust and start to build a relationship with them that you can then act. Mm -hmm. um, so just getting acclimated, uh, I think, is a big part of it. But then act, don't mm -hmm. wait. Mm -hmm. Well, this was just such a great conversation. I, I'm thankful to be part of a community and the Cascade Community Foundation. Thank you so much for hosting us. Truly an eye-opening and wonderful resource for our viewers. I'm back now with Tessa Kina from Hungerford Nichols CPAs and Advisors. Tessa, uh, you spent a lot of time with these four individuals to really unpack what it might be like for somebody who's struggling. So one of our mm -hmm. viewers that might be struggling right now, um, go into a little bit about what you think was the big picture. Like if mm -hmm. somebody's walking away, what should they take away right now? You know, there were so many great topics that we discussed. One of one of the um, the topics that Jordan brought up was kind of that ostrich in the sand idea. You know, if you hide from this the topic it's not gonna go away. I mean, you talked about how this is everywhere, it's in our everyday lives. And so just being open to the conversation, I think is the first step to you know learning and growing. Yeah, and all four of them really had um, information on how to make that first step. And a lot of it was based on their own lives, mm -hmm. but certainly the experiences that they've gained from working with clients. You as a certified public accountant, you probably see this stuff a lot as well. What are some of the first steps that you advise your clients on? Yeah, so this is a topic that comes up often. You know, we have a lot of entrepreneurs in, in West Michigan alone. And what I always tell people, and I know my colleagues will do the same, is, is just taking that first step of having a conversation, you know, reaching out. We like to try and encourage them to get a team of people. So you want to have an accountant, an investment advisor, a good banker, an attorney, a insurance agent. You know, so really having a good team around you. And, and also understanding that there is an investment, but that investment in the beginning you know, it's really gonna set you up for success in the long term. Yeah, and, and I think really getting over the anxiety and stress and fear of looking at whether it's a pile of bank statements mm -hmm. that you're just so fearful of versus actually starting to separate this out in a strategic manner, taking the step and trying to just get over that fear something that you see in the eyes of somebody across the table for you as a CPA very often in those yeah. first initial conversations? Yeah, it's really my, my goal as an advisor is to really help reduce that fear and reduce that stress level. We talk about taking that team approach, so we wanna be part of your team. We wanna help you and encourage you. You know, you as a business owner have an expertise and we're coming alongside of you, um, part of your toolkit. And so whatever we can do to just help ease the burden and help you be successful and grow in your business, that will be our ultimate goal. 
Yeah, wonderful. Well, it's been wonderful to have you here with us and we appreciate the time that you took with these four amazing experts and for them to guide people into taking that first step uh, as well as many other steps if they chose to. Uh, we really appreciate it. So thanks for thanks for joining us. Tessa. Thank you so much. It's yeah. been a pleasure. Yeah. And I want to thank our annual partners who make the Q&A live stream possible, including Hunger for Nichols, Ella's Law, and of course, this season's Underwriter Consumers Credit Union. Episode two is coming up next, and we will include a telling inside conversation with local business owners, Jermail Eddy, owner of Malamaya Juice Bar, as well as Scott and Christine Vogel, owners of Nothing Bunt Cake. Of course, we will be right here in studio to help guide you through their testimony with two amazing guests, Ellie Fried Zagel of Successful Generations and Shannon Dwyer from Consumers Credit Union. If you would like to recommend topics for the Q&A live stream, we would love to have them. Check out our annual survey at surveyccf.com. As always, if you would like to support Cascade Community Foundation's ongoing nonprofit programming, like the Q&A live stream series, please visit qalivestream.org and click donate. On behalf of our board of directors at Cascade Community Foundation and our annual partners, thank you for watching. Hi, I'm Scott Dobson with Consumers Credit Union, and today we'll be talking about reducing and eliminating debt. Cool little program that uh, takes about 10 minutes to do. Get yourself a piece of paper, a giant whiteboard, or maybe even an Excel spreadsheet. We'll uh, identify and organize your debt, put it together, and give you a simple strategy to really eliminate all of your debt. Like I said, the first thing that we need to do is identify debt. The very first step in that is organizing all your bills, really just getting them in a big pile and saying, all right, here's all my bills and writing them down into a little chart like this, like I said, on an Excel spreadsheet or even a piece of paper. Um, in this particular case, we're gonna have four debts. You might have two debts you wanna consolidate or 22. It doesn't matter. The process is the same um, of organizing them so that we can eliminate them. Let's start with understanding them. Get your statement out and let's write down a few key things that we need to know about each one of your debts. The name, let's start with our first one. We'll call it student loan. How much we owe on that debt? Let's say 22,000 on this loan. The interest rate that you're being charged, 6% set for this student loan, and the minimum monthly payment. In this case, let's say it's $250. And then what you wanna do is repeat that for all of your other debts. In our case, we're gonna have a car loan, and we're gonna have a card, number one and we'll have a credit card and we just fill out all of these brackets for all of the debt that you have all right now that we have all these filled in um, we have definitely organized our debt we understand who we owe how much the interest rate and the minimum monthly payment now let's prioritize them you can prioritize by the one that you'd pay off the fastest you could prioritize by the one that has the highest interest rate. However makes you feel good. For us, we're gonna go highest interest rate and pay it off the quickest to make us feel good. So the card that, what we're gonna pay off first, our debt, is this credit card. What would make me feel uh, next best to pay off is the other credit card. And I think I'd prefer to pay off my car loan before my student loans, because so that'll be my number three priority. And the last thing that I'm gonna pay off um, is my student loans. Now you've got a great snapshot of all of your debt, who you owe it to in the priority, and let's take a minute and, and talk about budgets. These are your minimum payments. If we add this, you can see that right now to pay your monthly bills on time, as you're supposed to without late fees or anything, um, you've committed to pay $600 a month. And let's think about debt reduction and you really need to look at your own finances and say, boy, how much extra can I afford to put to reduce my debt? 
It could be $25 a month. It could be $1,000 a month. It's your personal budget, but it's something that you want to be able to commit to and stick with. So in our case, we're going to say, boy, we've got an extra $25 a week or $100 a month that we can devote to debt reduction. How do we put that to its best use? So let's cross this out. All right, we're not going to spend $600 maintaining our debt. We're going to start spending $700 reducing our debt. Let's do it. The first thing we're going to do is look at our number one priority that we want to pay off. Take this extra $100 and put it straight to that. Now, if you're not paying your bills online uh, with Consumers Credit Union using our bill pay system, you definitely should be. Automation makes life easy. These bills are for the same amount to the same place at the same time every single month. Let's get online and set them up so that they're set up with automatic payments so those payments are made when they're supposed to be. Everyone will be for just this amount in card number two. We're gonna change that to 150, so they're getting an extra $100 a month. Now you can imagine you set this, you forget it, your paycheck's coming in, your bills are being paid on time, this card's being paid down, and eventually, in a few months, several months, many months, you're gonna get this paid down to zero, and that's awesome, because at that time, this big, giant eraser comes in, and you get to get rid of this debt and eliminate it. That is the best feeling. This is gone. This is spent, and guess what? We don't have to spend this $150 anymore. Now we've gotten pretty comfortable seven, spending $700 a month. We've gotten good at eliminating debt. Let's keep doing that. We had this 150 here. We're gonna add it to our second priority. So instead of spending $100 a month, we're gonna go into uh, online banking. We're gonna switch our automatic payment to 250 a month. And guess what? We're gonna let it go again automatically. And every month, this card's gonna get paid down by way more than the minimum payment we pay it down. And eventually, what's gonna happen? You guessed it. We're gonna pay off this card as well. And then we've got this extra $250 a month. Where's it going? It's going straight to our car payment. Wow, now our car payment's getting a $450 a month payment on it. We're still spending the same amount we've been paying to pay off all those credit cards, but they're gone. We're just focusing on our car and our student loans. Guess what, it almost double payment on that car, man. Next thing you know, that car payment's paid off. And what do we do now? All of a sudden, we only have one debt left in the world, and it's getting crushed at $700 a month. Over the course of all of this, we haven't spent one more penny than we decided to in the first day. And over time, without taking any other actions, we've been able to pay off all of our debts. Whether you have two debts, 25 debts, put this system together, Use our cool automated systems at consumercu.org, online or with your phone. Um, make it easy on yourself. Set up a budgeting and reduce your debt and feel, feel better about your personal finances. Thanks again, I'm Scott Dobson with Consumers Credit Union.